Welcome to the Moving to Online Learning presentation. I'm Dr. Shirley Campbell. I have very much appreciated being invited to speak with you today. I look forward to checking, chatting with you a little bit when this presentation is over. I earned a doctorate in instructional design and technology at the University of Pittsburgh. I've taught from kindergarten to eighth grade, as well as in the instructional instruction and learning department at the University of Pittsburgh School of Education. I currently teach in a fully online program at Kennesaw State University Bagwell College of Education. I live in Pennsylvania. The program is run in Georgia, which is about a 12-hour drive from my house. At Kennesaw, I've had students from as many as four states at the same time in the course. Previously at Seton Hill University in Pennsylvania, I developed their first fully online program in instructional design and technology with a component for teacher education. I've also had the opportunity to serve as a volunteer program consultant for the ISTE conference. I worked alongside their program chair, Camilla Gagliola, for eight years to create the conference program each year. I've also had the opportunity to work with NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I worked with subject matter experts who are scientists and astronauts to develop content for K-12 related to the work done at NASA, much of which was offered online. I've had the same kinds of experiences as many of you. Before the pandemic, I was a teacher in a busy classroom. Although I do teach online, I also provide professional development to teachers, and that has changed for the moment as well. I have been blessed to have opportunities to visit your beautiful country several times and have even visited your amazing university. Now, because of the pandemic, everyone in teaching in person has had to stop in their tracks and figure out how to continue helping people to learn without coming in contact with them. The slowly growing online learning industry has suddenly had to become full time. Sharing our own learning about learning is the best way that we, are, that we can provide the best learning for our students. I'm hoping that I can provide an overview of several areas that I believe are key when moving to online learning. It's important to continue the pace of online learning at the pace of pre-pandemic student learning in classrooms. We all want students to get the best possible learning, despite having to change everything about where and when to learn by taking advantage of the best online options. By providing the best fit between online learning format to the needs of your students and the requirements of your content, you will assure that your students reach their goals and your goals for them. Using the online learning tools to assure that we are addressing the goals, objectives, and standards that we intend to address in everything we do will assure that our students are learning what they need to learn. Just so we are all thinking in the same direction, I'm defining online learning here to be any kind of course where student and teacher interaction is done completely online. Blended learning or a situation where students meet with instructors in face-to-face -face setting at some points in time and do some of their work and interaction online can be very successful in most situations. In the current state of pandemic, however, and in many other situations, online learning can be quite successful as well. As we start working on this, I want to start with some specific words that I'll use frequently. Some of them have many meanings, and I would like to make sure that we all understand them the same way. The words online learning can mean many different things, and what I'm talking about today is online learning that is completely online with no in-person and generally no face-to-face in-person contact. Today we're discussing coursework and longer-term experiences, although mo many of these concepts can also be applied to one or two hour workshops. Synchronous means things that are happening at the same time, and in online learning, synchronous means that sessions or classes are being held while students and teachers are joining together at the same time, whether they are seeing one another in video, simply using an online document that everyone can edit, or having an audio conference. It's still synchronous if everyone is on at the same time. Asynchronous means that everyone is experiencing the same information, but they're doing it their own schedule on their own time. This refers to things like watching a video that's been placed online. Everyone can watch it at their own schedule. They don't have to watch it together. Real time alludes to the actual time when something takes place. Learning management system classes or classroom management systems are online web-based tools where coursework and materials are organized and interactions between students, content, and teachers takes place. Each LMS provides a collection of specific tools that can be used together to organize classrooms, classroom content, to organize material, and even to organize students. There are many online learning systems, and each includes a variety of resources. Some popular LMSs include Blackboard, Edmodo, D2L, Mosaic, and Moodle, and there are many more. 
Video meeting tools have increased dramatically in popularity in the United States since the pandemic began. Zoom has become a household word and families and friends have been connected using Zoom to socialize from a distance. Zoom has also been used very extensively for teaching in K-12 since schools have had to close. Other video meeting tools include Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, GoToMeeting, Skype, and WebEx, and there are many, many more. Video meeting tools offer an opportunity to live, deliver content real-time or synchronously, allowing students to explore content with their instructor and get real-time feedback. This can also ensure understanding before students move to the next part of the content or attempt to complete an assignment. Often there's a video meeting tool within a learning management system, but even if there's not, video meeting tools are very useful and can be found most anywhere. Many of them are free or at a low cost. There are some advantages to online learning. Students can access and react to information as they find it useful. They can go back in and review re information again and again. In the past, they could review text as often as they liked and often had notes, but with online learning, even lectures are usually available as recordings. A huge advantage for instructors is the ability to use properties of their LMS to copy courses. Once a course is created and the structure is logical, instructors can create new courses by copying them, then just changing the material in the copied version. This method can be used to create new courses or to create new versions of old ones, like a course taught in the fall term that will be taught again in the spring. All of the material in the course is stored within the learning management system. I really loved it when I started using online learning because my students had to submit their work online. I didn't have to worry about if I left their papers in the office and wanted to grade them at home or if someone handed me a paper outside of class and I had to remember where to put it so that it didn't get lost. The assignment submissions were always in the same place and my responses to students would be there as well. Students also could get the responses to their work as quickly as I could grade it. In addition to providing information about readings, videos of lectures, video or video guides for how to use a tool or many other items, I like the convenience of adding links to website inside the learning management system. Students can go directly to sites that you find valuable if you feel they fit the content. Some cautions as we're moving down this path. Organization of online material is critical. Without logical organization, students may get lost in the information and not be able to access it when expected. If the process isn't clear, they may access content out of order, causing confusion. Carefully considering the layout of the content and providing guidance to students on how to complete the course is very important to their success. Organization of the material in the course is also critical to student perception of the value of the course. If they see the course as disorganized, they will see the content as disorganized most likely as well. Share the reasons behind some of your, the organization with them early in the class so they can take full advantage of your preparations for their success. In an online learning situation, instructors bear the burden of making and maintaining contact with their students. In situations where students are expected to work together or build cohorts, the instructor is also responsible for guiding the students to connect to one another. It's important that instructors regularly make an effort, effort to outreach to their students to offer assistance, reinforce successes, and provide discussion opportunities. When regular real-time opportunities are provided, students are more likely to spontaneously share concerns, ask questions, and contribute to discussions. For example, I like to offer weekly office hours where students can earn bonus, bonus points or the answer to an assignment question or a quiz question for attending. It encourages them to attend, and once they've joined in, students usually take part in chatting with the instructor or other students. Informal opportunities like this help them feel more open and free about asking questions and bringing up discussion points. Again, quizzes and assignments have to be carefully considered because there is no instructor oversight. While, like those that are offered in a face-to-face -face real time classroom, those students are not being watched by an instructor and they can open their textbook, they can use online resources, they can talk to other students when completing a quiz. So the quizzes have to be designed to bring in higher order thinking skills like synthesis and evaluation rather than recall from text. When creating a course it's important to consider the pace of learning. Assuring that students are provided with content at a reasonable pace 
requires assuring that the content can be successfully mastered as scheduled. This is true of online learning as well as in-person learning. When teaching in person, you probably think of your course components in chunks based from one meeting time to the next, maybe thinking that the, that the reading before a lecture, the lecture, any assignments, quizzes, and tests are a single course component. They are usually based on a single topic area or a group of related topics. The same kinds of structures exist in online learning and they're frequently called modules. Modules consist of multiple parts and are focused on specific learning goals and objectives. Objectives: A module can include basic instruction on a concept, extension instru instruction on a concept for a learner who needs more information, assignments for learning the concept, assignments for applying the concepts learned, usually for assessment purposes, and often modules include instruction concerning tools to be used to complete the assignments for those who need it. For example, in one of my courses, I provide video demonstrations for how to create a pie chart or a bar graph in Excel so that they can use those to create their um, assignments. In the case of this pandemic, many instructors are trying to figure out how to replace in-person learning with fully online learning and are worried about the pace. When switching from in-person to online, consider the pace of the interaction in your in-person courses with the students and the requirements of their work as scheduled online. Did you meet with your class every week? Did you meet with your class every day? Were there multiple meetings in a week? Did you meet with them twice a month and expect them to work on their own independently in between? Online earning, learning offers so many different formats for time with students and pacing of coursework. If you expected specific coursework to occur within a week or two week period, it makes sense to begin with that structure when you move online. Options for on pacing online are numerous. You can create regular synchronous contact, for example, meeting synchronously three times per week for an hour each time. You could plan to meet synchronously with students only once every two weeks. You could also go to the other end of the spectrum and include no synchronous sessions and no organized real-time meetings. Create modules that include enough time for students to master the content in the module. While it's easier to create a study routine with modules that are the same length each time, in some cases when modules are different are that in some cases modules that involve different lengths are more applicable. Also consider the, the extent to which coursework builds on previous coursework. You can create deadlines for work throughout the online course so that students must complete one work in one area and get feedback before moving on to the next to assure that basic content is mastered before students attempt to build on it. I'll provide some examples of these ideas in a minute. There also is an opportunity when content components don't build on one another for students to work on any part of the course at a time. Note that LMSs provide options for allowing students to see specific content at specific times. It's possible to control the amount of looking ahead they can do. In some cases that can be valuable, while in others quite detrimental. If the next assignment provides answers to the current assignment, you may want to keep it hidden until all students have completed the current assignment. If students are working independently, they should likely have access to all of the work so that they can continue unhindered. Here's a screenshot of the opening page of the course I'm teaching this summer. Note the quick course dates list in the top left and the content browser on the right. The course dates section is static with no links, but gives students information about everything you'll be covering and when. And you can see the timeline. The content browser, on the other hand, provides all the course information in one place, helping to create a solid organization. The announcement section on the lower left is an area where I regularly, at least once per week, attempt to connect with students by providing feedback on recently graded assignments, hints and suggestions for the upcoming assignments, newsworthy items that pertain to the class, and housekeeping information. On the lower left is a calendar. Assignments are populated to the calendar automatically when I enter a deadline for the assignment, and students can see at a glance when they're due. There are also many link, links to many of the components of the course on the menu part near the top of the screen, course home, content, discussions, assignment, quizzes, other, etc. Some are my um, headings and some students don't see. Below the screen are several, below the slide, 
are several other sections, one with a link to a synchronous session video chat room, one with information about me and a photo, links to various types of student support provided by the university, and some administrative links just for me to, for developing and editing in this course. Now let's take a deep, deeper look at the content browser. The Syllabus and Resources folder contains all of the rubrics for the course, templates for students to use in completing their assignments, the syllabus, and other resources that students need to complete the course. There are, these are generally global resources useful in many or many, any or many parts of the course, and in the case of some of the rubrics, there are also links with the specific modules where they're used. I like them to be available here because when students first begin to work on the course, they can see everything that's expected of them and they can prepare. In the next course I show to you, you'll see that these resources are offered right on the home screen instead of in a folder. I prefer the folder because it reduces the clutter on the home screen, but still provides everything at a single click or at most two. Each module folder contains all of the information for each one week module. In this folder for module one, you can see the assignments that students are required to complete. They can upload files here or can upload them in the menu bar on the course homepage we saw two slides ago. Each module has a Start Here section, which includes videos of the lectures, video clips describing how to complete specific tasks, remember the Excel files, and any other content re relevant to the module. Each module is similar in design so students know what to expect and where to find the information that they need. This is a screenshot of a course I taught last term. The requirements for this course include quite a bit of experience with web-based tools, so the timeline is a bit different. The term is 14 weeks, but the modules were created in different lengths. The module at the end encompasses the week of spring break, so it's quite a bit longer. It also encompasses a learning activity that requires that the students incorporate components that they've completed throughout the entire course. The assignments are due at several different points in this course. Note that the list of resources is on the right of the screen. I added a calendar on the far right, so it's kind of in the middle. It's separate from the content browser. The announcement section is below the content browser, but you can see the screen at the top, the box at the top where meet your instructor information is. Also in this program, students are not required to attend synchronous sessions, but optional synchronous sessions are offered. The sessions are recorded and made available to all students after the session is held. Now that you've seen a few of the options I used in courses, let's talk about the range of possibilities a bit. Let's talk, look at the two extremes of interactivity and scheduling in courses. These two options are the far extremes of the range of a continuum of possible options available. Nearly all courses follow between these extremes. In one type of course, the end of the course is the only deadline. Everything has to be turned in by the end. Students can work successfully, independently, and completely at their own pace, but I wouldn't give this to freshmen because they have to be able to work independently. The lectures can be offered as a video component. Students can be working in various parts of the course at any time, and that makes it difficult for any kinds of discussions between students, and it limits the use of discussion boards for interactivity. This type of timeline might work well, for example, in a course that offers instruction on several com different components where students learn one of them, use it, apply it, and then move on to the next. Students would be able to move through the course comfortably by themselves in whichever order they like. But they definitely need to be independent and motivated learners. An example of content that can be offered in any order, a course that provides instruction on multiple software or apps that work independently of one another. There may be sections on word processing app, a photo editing app, a website building app, a survey creation app, and a video editing app. No section requires information taught in the other sections. They can be completed in any order. On the opposite end of the spectrum is a course where success in each module requires success in the previous module. Assignment deadlines happen in succession. Students must complete each module or section by a deadline, inclusive of all of the activities for that component, and ideally students will receive feedback on their submissions before they are far into the next module. At Kennesaw, we try to provide responses within three to five days in a full-term course, and in one to three days in an abbreviated course. 
Example of content that requires building of content from the previous module, the course that I'm teaching this term offers understanding and involves understanding and using data to guide changes in teaching within a school. Each module builds on the content learned in an earlier module. While I do not require synchronous meetings, I do frequently provide videos to provide information in this course. There are no discussion posts and no interaction between students is required. In my spring course, students were required to post discussion boards to Twitter and to video chat options for each module and they had to respond to one, another post, one another's posts. Aside from designing the course to meet goals, objectives, and standards, a strong avenue to Most of these types of activities are available inside an LMS. Online learning can include many of the same activities you use in a face-to-face -face classroom setting. Readings from assigned texts will likely always be used in courses. In some cases, the textbooks can also be provided online. Links to websites you'd like students to review or links to websites where they can apply their, their learning can be provided. Discussion board posts can require students to interact with one another within the LMS. As they carry on conversations and comment on content posted by others, they can add meaning and depth to their understanding of the content. If group work is important to your content, students can be assigned to work in a group to complete assignments together. They can use any of the synchronous meeting, meeting options or they can work asynchronously depending on the requirements. As I mentioned earlier, quizzes, quizzes and exams are viable in online learning and I recommend them for enforcing con consumption of content, for example, readings or required visit videos. Quizzes can also be used to demonstrate understanding by asking students to apply material as long as you are aware that they can be using textbooks or the internet or each other while completing the quiz. The term authentic assessment indicates that the assessment requires students to apply the content they are learning and synthesize it to apply to a real life situation. In my data course that I'm teaching this term, my students must gather data from the school where they are working. They are then required to apply the concepts we are working on to assess the data and draw conclusions from the data as an assignment that they have to turn in. If they aren't working in a school, there is data online for each state level for schools in the United States that they can use. I've already explained that I offer guidance on using Microsoft Excel to create pie charts and, and bar charts and multivariable charts by using videos in the course content I provide. I also try to provide extension content when possible. This is not content that the students are responsible for or will be tested on, but would provide information related to what we are learning and students can then delve a little deeper into the content. On the opposite side, I try to cover the same content using multiple modalities like written, video, and audio so that students who learn better in different ways or students who need to see it in more than one way will have that opportunity. I let students know when all these op options are provided that they are only responsible for one but are welcome to use them all. I want to specifically mention rubrics. In the LMS I use, rubrics can be used to assess individual assignments, and I find this to be quite valuable. The use of a rubric designed with the goals, objectives, and standards in mind helps me to assure that I am leading the students in the appropriate direction. It helps me to assure that I'm grading fairly, that I'm using the same delineated criteria for each student. Using the rubric system in my LMS provides me with an easy way to respond very specifically to student work assuring that they are clear about my meaning and know exactly which part of their work I'm discussing. Here's an example of a detailed rubric for my spring term class. The rubric has six sections, but I barely fit two on this page. As a grade, as I grade, I select a box to choose a score, and I can adjust the actual score points if needed. I can also add a sentence or two to share my point of view or even provide compliments. Comments increase clarity because they are attached to the specific area of the grading. This rubric is much less detailed, but still provides a format for offering specific feedback quickly. I can provide specific feedback in any section when I'm grading, as well as provide a range of points that differs in each section. And it helps me to assure that I'm grading students against the same criteria without swaying from the goal. A quick refresher of the information we covered. 
First, determine the timeline for your online course based on the needs of your students and align the timeline to the content. Design your online materials in a way that will help you and your students reach your long-term goals. Use short objectives for assessment, for activities, and for creating modules that build on one another. Assure that assignments and assessments are designed so they will lead students to your goals and meet standards. A pattern of frequent connection to students and open communication processes from the beginning of the course will be invaluable to success for all of you. Make sure that your materials are organized in a logical way so that students feel that the course has order, that it is professional, that it is complete, and that it is valuable as you know it is. I thank you for your kind attention and I would love to entertain any questions or comments at this point. Thank you very much.